All right, good morning to everybody, and welcome to the College Church Online Sabbath School, hybrid Sabbath School, because we have people who are with us in the sanctuary today, maybe about uh, six, seven, eight people, um, and it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Yes, it is. I don't know why people didn't just wake up, open up the curtains and say, what a beautiful, sunny, warm day. You know, it's, it's, but it is, it is raining. It's kind of a raw feeling, but it's, we're going to make it nice. We're going to make it nice. So, I'm Aynar Ram, and we're going to, and with me is, as you know, Roger Prather. Good morning. And it's good to be together here. Um, last week we had Cameron with us, but he's teaching another class. And we are... Continuing through Isaiah, and the title for this week's lesson is When Your World is Falling Apart. And I have a feeling everybody can relate to that at some point in their lives, whether it could be right now. And we see, maybe it could be retitled, When the World is Falling Apart. <laughs> Indeed. And we, we're going to look here at King Ahaz and his response to what happened to him. Um, but before we do, I'm going to give out my phone number. Nobody ever really takes me up. Well, actually, you, maybe once, once per Sabbath, somebody will text me. Um, 978-833-4308 is my cell phone number. You can text me, comment or question whether you're here in the sanctuary or online. Um, especially text us if you think Roger is losing his mind. <laughs> That's a good possibility. <laughs> um, if I'm losing my mind, don't text me, because then I'll just dismiss you, right? <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> uh, so, but seriously, we'd like to have input. And probably that's the frustrating part with the, this format, is usually we have, as you remember, we have three Sabbath school classes going, and they're more interactive in discussion. And... Um, I'm hoping that summertime, fall, we'll, we'll see that coming back. But I have, I'm enjoying this, talking with you, Roger. Oh, this like is this. great. This I is, mean, this other is great. than everything, every, uh, beside the events that, that caused us to do this, yeah, this is, uh, yeah. this is a lot of fun. Yeah, it has been good. It's been rewarding. So, um, but let's pray. As we get started, as we look at this, really, I mean, it's really a timely lesson. It is. It is a timely lesson. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you know where we are right now. And it does feel like the world is falling apart in, in so many areas and respects. And so, Lord, we pray that, that what we study today will not just be a cognitive uh, experience, but it will be a, an emotional and a spiritual uh, experience that will, that will help us to deal with the unforeseens of life, the, the, the curveballs that come at us, even the fastballs. And so, Lord, we pray that you will help us to learn from, from this lesson some very practical lessons as, as we open up our Bibles and, of course, our hearts as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, the lesson begins with the memory text, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. That's an interesting sentence there, and we're going to unpack that throughout our discussion this morning. But I, when I read the... Uh, the Sabbath school, the, the lesson from last Sabbath. I'm going to lower my mic just a little bit. Um, I had a laugh for a moment. It's, it's a story, it's a tragic story about husband and wife, they're off to church, and while they're gone, a tragedy happens with a dog and kills a bird. And, and I'm like, okay, what's the moral of the story? Moral story, I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek, don't go to church. <laughs> <laughs> Be there so you can see this and stop it before it happens. So, but, I mean, it may not have been the case anyway, but it's, it's interesting. But it's true about life, you know. Um, we go somewhere, and, and uh, tragedies happen, accidents happen on vacation, and... and 
on just a, a pleasant trip. So we don't know how life can be. And, and uh, so uh, we're going to look at lesson number three, when your world is falling apart. And of course, we're in Isaiah, but this parallels with what's going on in uh, Kings and Chronicles. And we're going to dive in with Isaiah chapter 7, 1 through 9. Isaiah 7, 1 through 9. So, Roger, would you read that for us? I think we have time that we can just sure. literally go verse by verse or, or section by section. Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, the Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Romaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, The Arameans have camped in Ephraim, his heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shir Jeshub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint-hearted because of these two stubs of smolding firebrands on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ramalia. Because Aram with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has planned evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Now within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that it is no longer a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. You handle all those odd words very well, Roger. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> thank you. Some of them, like uh, the glare, I was like, uh, am I saying this right? But I hey, got through it. It, 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 it sounded good. So um, do you, what, what, what do you, what's going on here as a recap? There's a little bit of political intrigue yep. going on. <laughs> um, so you, you have... You have uh, as the lesson explains, you have what today we would call Syria. Right. And by this time, the northern and southern kingdoms are divided. The northern kingdom is a pretty idolatrous. Um, yeah. the, the, the northern tribes have turned to um, idolatry and a sort of syncretistic, uh, paganized version of, of uh, the temple worship. And so they sort of join forces, and they want to they wanna attack Judah, and they want to, as again, as the lesson explains, they want to take over Judah's resources and land and, and install a puppet king um, so that they can work together to sort of advance their political agenda in the region. And so what happens here? So who's uh, the, the, the king of, of Judah is, is um, Ahaz. Ahaz. And was he a good king or bad king? Well, we come to learn that he's not the best of kings. He's, he did some a pretty atrocious things we're going to get into. And, and uh, what ends up happening, he, he hears about this, and it's, it's true, there's a lot of politics involved, but there's a lot of emotions. There's a lot of reaction, and I think that's the key part about this lesson, is how do we respond to that moment when we come face to face with a huge problem? with a huge obstacle. How do we respond? And, and as you were reading here, first of all, I, I want to just give some backstory here. I still find it hard to comprehend that, of course, when Israel and Judah divide, that their animosity towards each other gets to be so hostile and strong that they fight each other, physically killing each other attacking each other, forming alliances with the other enemy, it's it just, sometimes I just, it just boggles my mind that these two groups of, of people 
trace their lineage back to the same place. And, and hear how this has deteriorated over time. And so that's why I come back to this book is also a book about sociology. Mm -hmm. Studying about how people think and act and what they do in various circumstances. Uh, but it's just like, why couldn't somebody say, hold the horses, stop the, stop the presses. We all go back to Abraham. Let's remember our common lineage. Let's remember our common lineage that we're, we're from the same place. But that doesn't happen. Tragedy doesn't happen. Of course, I'm oversimplifying because we're talking about centuries here of living. Right. Um, but it reminds me of the, the old story of the Hatfields and the McCoys, how this rift just mushrooms and snowballs into something bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was probably two, three decades ago where there was some sort of a, a reconciliation, a symbolic reconciliation between the Hatfields and the McCoys. I have to look that up. But it's, it's uh, I remember that happened. It was, you know, they got together and they sort of embraced and, 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 and it was kind of a nice closure to a, a situation that got way out of hand. And I, my wife would remember what it was over, was it over a pig? Anybody remember? Oh, I, th I thought I remembered one time they couldn't even really figure out. Yeah, they couldn't figure out, but it was also, maybe it was a pig? I don't know, but if anybody has any thoughts about it. But it, it just starts from the smallest thing, and then it escalates, and, and mushrooms, and then we forget why we're fighting. And it's, it's, uh, it just breaks my heart. This is Israel. There's, and, and so their animosity towards Judah is so strong, they're going to go and, and work with, um, with um, just draw a blank here. You should mention Syria. Syria. And, and they, what do those guys have in common? Not much. <laughs> I mean, as you mentioned, their, their religious beliefs had, you know, sort of come in pair, but it just breaks my heart. And, and so it comes to this, and, and um, you know, there are things, so what's going to happen here is this, the, Judah gets attacked, and what does King Ahaz do? Does he say, we're ready for this? No, he freaks we're, out. He freaks out. Fear. Fear. You said, you, you asked the rhetorical question, you know, what do we, what do, we do when things go terribly wrong? And I think uh, probably the most common initial reaction for a human being is, is fear. Yep. And it's usually fear of the unknown. Or I think in Ahaz's case, and in a lot of our cases, um, it's also a fear of losing control. We like yeah. having the illusion that we are in control, that we're able to manipulate our immediate circumstances. And um, I think... The, the turn of events that Isaiah and, and Second Kings and Chronicles talks about is, you know, they're the, the things that instill fear in Ahaz. And of course, during those centuries too, not to overly moralize it, but over those centuries too, those ethnic and cultural ties deteriorated because both in both cases, Judah obviously remains the remnant sort of people. Yep. Um, where, where true worship of the true God sort of is maintained and carries the, the narrative of Scripture forward. But in both instances, what you end up happening, what ends up happening is um, when they're confronted by these circumstances in the world, both of them start to look to the world for yeah. the ways they ought to react. Yeah. And, and what, do, you know, what do these nations do when they're in fear? You know, of course, Israel... The reason Israel's cooperating with this larger, more powerful um, political into kingdom um, is because Israel itself is in fear. It's a smaller nation. It's in fear of being overtaken. It's in, in fear of t being taken into uh, sub subjugation to, a, to another kingdom. Yeah. And so in order to preserve this sort of sovereignty that they have, they do what the world expects them to do. They ally with a a larger neighbor that may or may not have, like, you know, brings you in conflict with people with whom they shared ethnic and cultural ties. Yeah. And it's interesting, by the way, somebody texted me, thank you, 
that the dispute was over the ownership of two razor, razor-backed hogs. Two hogs. <laughs> two hogs were valuable back then. Yeah, worth <laughs> animosity for generations, bloodshed, all that. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. But so, it goes to show too. I mean, that the, the Hatfield and McCoys and Israel and Judah, it, you know, it becomes um, our egos get involved. We and do. I think that's the that's problem. a big problem here with Ahaz as well. As our egos get involved, and it's it's no longer. It really isn't about two pigs. It's about my ego. Is my can I make my ego? bigger than my, my, yeah. my adversary's ego, you know, or can I satisfy my own yeah. egotistic drive? And on that note, you mentioned that the problem was they were trying to solve these problems the world's way. And I can't but help forget that moment that just seems so innocent and logical in David's life when he says, I'm going to count the men. You remember the story. He counts the men. And God is so upset with him that he gives him those three options of punishment and, and he chooses to fall on God's mercy. But when you look at David, it was, uh, that's probably the scary part. It was a logical decision. You need to know how many troops you have. But that's what God didn't want him to know. This was supposed to be done by faith. And this was to be done by faith. And, and and not by, okay, I have more men than he has, so we can do this. If God says, do it, and you're outnumbered, you're supposed to do it. And that's, that's a challenge for us as human beings. And Ahaz saw this big threat, and he, like you said, he freaks out. And, and I like what, what it says here. The Lord said in verse 3, the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub and meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct. I like the way it's so detailed. At the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. It's interesting how this is all compartmentalized. Say to him, this is interesting instruction. I think this is timely for us today. Be careful. Be, keep calm. And don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Look at the sequence of instruction he gives. Be careful. Keep calm. You know, we've all seen those show, those shirts, t-shirts, keep calm and carry on. Mm -hmm. And you know, the backstory was yes. from World War II, yep. And, and keep calm and carry on. And of course, there's been so many variations about keep calm and caffeine on or whatever, you know, right. they, they have different hundreds of variations. Um, but to just to keep calm, there is a lot of just assurance about just, okay, take a deep breath. This is a big thing, but God still is on his throne. God is still on his throne today. He was yesterday and he will be, let's get very timely on January 20, on January 21 and 22. He will be on his throne. He's not going to, you know, step down from, from his, his role. And we, that's something that Ahaz seems to have forgotten, like we often forget. Yes. We often forget that uh, the same instruction given to Ahaz is for us. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Some, very similar to the advice that the angel of the Lord gave to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Absolutely. You know, here Joshua was taking a, a, a untrained, you know, I've read some archaeologists and historians of, of the Israelite conquest, and, you know, they, they come up with different ways of imagining or theorizing about you know, what, what, what that particular period in, in biblical history was all about and how it went about. And, you know, I've read some that have talked about, you know, they, these guys were armed with farm implements. Yeah. And they were going up against um, established, fortified uh, cities. Yeah. And so the, the, the advice, you know, be strong and courageous. And then you also think of, uh, this is kind of like going off uh, on, a, on a somewhat of a tangent, but you also think of 
was, it was uh, Elijah's prayer. He said, you know, Lord, you know, open their eyes so that they can see. Yeah. And they see, you know, um, the, whole, the armies of the Lord yep. there to, um, to fight on their behalf. And so, you know, take a God's eye perspective. I think that's sort of like where the lesson's going to, you know, take, take God's perspective. Of course, here we are in the 21st century. We have the benefit of the entire narrative of Scripture. But, you know, moving forward, you know, God makes kingdoms rise and God makes kingdom, kingdoms fall. And the, it all works according to his purpose. So, yeah. um, and Ahaz, Ahaz should have known better because he had that experience. He had the, the, the knowledge and the experience of what Joshua went through and what prior, um, yeah. uh, prior monarchs in, in, in Judah and Israel had gone through. So, Yeah, very true. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was talking with somebody, and, and uh, sometimes we just need somebody else to coach us, guide us through a crisis. Uh, Isaiah goes to Ahaz with his son. Interesting little tidbit there. And so there's two of them go there and they talk to Ahaz. And they're supposed to say the simple, simple marching orders. Sometimes A, seeing another person is good. And, and seeing somebody who knows more than you do is even gooder. <laughs> uh, because I'm sure Ahaz at least knew who Isaiah was. Sure. And he would have said, oh, man of God is here. And maybe he has some instructions for us, for me. And so that visual impact of seeing him with his son and, and uh, hearing these words should somehow shake us into reality. Sort of give us that, you know, cold water in the face. That some of us we need to say, okay, it's going to be okay. It will be okay. Um, and, and don't lose heart. And so often we make decisions, Roger, and, and we all know this. We make decisions based off of fear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I won't do this one activity because of fill in the blank. I won't talk to that person because I'm fill in the blank. And the list goes on and on. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but sometimes we, we, we must step out of our comfort zone. And I'm speaking to myself. Speak, we got to get out of our comfort zone. And sometimes if we don't walk out of our comfort zone, we get pushed out of our comfort zone. And uh, many of you probably have read that book, the overpriced, cheesy book, Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> You know, I, I maybe story did. I don't know. It was it was like a decade ago about this maze, about where um, there were these mice. Have you read this book? You've read okay. And so, basically, what happens? These mice always know where the cheese is. They live in a maze. And then one day, somebody moves the cheese. One of there's two mice, if I remember right. One just totally freaks out. Then life is over. The other one says, "Well, wait a second. This is a challenge." And so they keep looking for it, and eventually they find it. And they realize that activity helps them embrace change the next time the cheese is moved. Mm. And, and there's something about that. To, to take this incident when, when Judah's getting invaded, when Jerusalem's getting invaded, to develop our faith rather than have it be crushed. Mm. <clears throat> and... That is, I think that's one of the reasons why God allows some things to come our way so that our faith will grow and mature and our roots will grow deeper because he sees the end from the beginning and he knows, okay, if you, as it says here, be careful, be calm, don't be afraid, don't lose heart. Our confidence in God will grow and will grow stronger. Um, but I'm going off here, it's, you know, I just keep talking about this because it just seems so timely. This lesson is very timely. Extraordinarily. It's like, wow. It's, it, and I'm going to say, I'm, I have, it, it, it's just amazing because as I mentioned before, this, these start, this process started five years ago. And who would have known that this would be a lesson we needed right now? 
with all the anxiety that's going on in the world today with everything happening with the COVID and, you know, in, uh, on January 20, whichever way you are on that, but it's still, nonetheless, it's, it's so timely. God knows the end from the beginning. He really does. But people are still, even Christians, even in the church, if you pay attention to what people are saying out in the world, you know, people are in fear. They are fear, yeah. And um, a lot of people are saying things or encouraging other people to do things on both sides of, of yep. the, the disputes um, that aren't, aren't particularly wise. No. And these are coming from Christians, you know. Yeah, just I know. go, I mean, if you want to be entertained, go on YouTube. Yeah. And, you know, just do some searches and start listening to what some of these self-identified preachers out there telling some of their congregations to do on one side or the other, and some of it's just wacky. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and people, and, 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 and people are, are, I think a lot of it is driven by fear, the same kind of, the fear of the unknown. I mean, ultimately, I, I've read, you know, I've read psychological things where, you know, um, people will put forth the idea that ultimately all fear is driven by the unknown. Mm -hmm. we, we instinctually fear that which we can't, comprehend or that which we don't understand or can't right. predict or like two mice in a maze yep. you know when somebody moves the cheese and yep. um, I guess that's the benefit of age you know the older you get I don't see anybody in here younger than probably 40 I'm, I'm sorry everyone but um, what do you mean story is what 29 <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that's one of the advantages you know of, of, of getting older you know you, you see I, I remember the calm of my grandfather. You know, my grandfather had lived through World War I, the Great Depression, World War yeah. II, all, all of that stuff. And, wow. you know, I just remember when, you know, as he was older in life and I was, I'm his grandson and, you know, just it didn't matter what happened. He was always just calm, you know, calm. just kind of shrugged it all off and just keep, he stayed calm and Stay calm and carried on. Stay, stay calm, carry on. And as Christians, we have this benefit. As Ahaz had that benefit. That's, you know, I think that's one of the major things that we should reinforce is that Ahaz had not in, in, in as complete a state, but he had the benefit of the same knowledge that, that we have today, which is what we're talking about. You know, it, it doesn't matter what happens. Yeah. Ultimately, God's still in control. He yeah. knows how this is going to go. And w whatever way people decide, whatever crazy decisions people make, he's going to manipulate th those situations in order to bring about his yeah. ultimate will. And there's, there's on another level, too, like when I, I talk to other Seventh-day Adventists, I mean, like, I'm very interested in this. You know, I'm a student of political theory and things. And, you know, I watch what's going on in the world, and it's all very fascinating and as a student of it, but then I talk to other Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians, and you know, some of them are ramped up and fearful. And I, I heard a guy on the on the radio this morning talking about how a, a woman was talking about uh, she lives in Florida, and the Florida Electric com Florida Power and Light was using drones to come and like do something with the the electricity in, in wherever she lived in Florida, and, and she was interviewing this guy who was. Uh, who was, uh, he, he actually was Roman Catholic, but he's just like, well, be careful because, you know, those drones might be used to be looking for Christians soon, you know, and it's, oh. you know, you, people, you get people ramped up in the fear, and then, but as Seventh-day Adventists, I think we have, we have this great benefit of knowledge. We have this very comprehensive understanding about world events and the direction that it goes and our history in terms of things like church-state relations and religious liberty yeah. and, and, and things like that, and like, we, we really shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be fearful at all. No. It might be tense. Things might be tense. We might have questions, but we, we ought not to be fearful. No. That's very true. Very true. So, I didn't mean to make a tangent there, but no, practical but application. <coughs> the reason <coughs> why this lesson is so important is because where it's going, and I'm looking at the time, because it leads up to something really, really profound. Um, let's just look here at verse 10. Again, well, let's back up here. We're jumping over a whole, much, a whole section of Scripture. Um, and, I, you know, last week I brought my progressive lenses. Got them. They were in the car. <laughs> Today I left them at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is it? Verse 7. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place 
<coughs> it isn't going to happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus. The head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too, will be too shattered to be a people. <coughs> the head of Ephra, Ephraim is Samaria. <coughs> Excuse me. And the head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Wow. That's interesting punchline. If you don't stand firm in your faith, you're not going to stand at all. <laughs> what do you think, Roger, he's saying here? I mean, this is, it's, is he saying like, if you don't stand for this, your true inner lack of resilience is going to be there. It's going to be exposed. You're just going to, if you don't stand for this, you're going to fall for anything. As the saying goes, if people who don't stand for anything, what is this? People who don't stand for something will fall for anything? Yeah. Similar idea, it seems like. Similar. But, but a little bit different. But not so generic. Hmm? But not so generic. Right, right. Um, I, I, you know, I, when I was thinking about this, when I, when I initially read the lesson, there's a lot of ways you could go with that. I mean, on one hand, you have Isaiah's ministry as a prophet is established, um, and of course, this is during a period, you know, you, have, you still have schools of the prophets, and, you know, people are identified as having this particular gift. So Ahaz knows who he's speaking to. He knows that what he says is reliable. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's a history at this point um, with Isaiah, and that he's a, he, he's, his word is trustworthy, his advice is trustworthy. But I, at, at the same time, Isaiah is just coming right out and saying, like, if you just relax and stay put, everything's going to be fine. Yep. You know, like God's offering to, you know, it, there's a fork in the road here. You know, it's, yep. like, it's like one of those books where it's like, you know, choose, choose your next step. And if yep. you choose step A, you know, turn the page. If you choose step B, turn, turn, yep. turn to page 75 or whatever. You know, yeah, I've never the, done one of those, as far as I can remember. I need to, oh, yeah. Oh, no? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're a good time. I mean, <coughs> I haven't done one in a long time, but, you know, the kids used to have them. But, yep. you know, it's one of those types of scenarios. And, and, and you know, God's reassuring him. He's in, you know, God's in control no matter what. But he does give us, you know, this free will aspect. We get to make choices. And what Ahaz has here is the benefit of, you know, I'm, I'm telling you for sure if you do this, if you, if you take... If you take fork A, yep. this is how it's going to wind up. Everything's going to be fine. These are, you know, they're, 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 again, God's, eyes, God's eye view, they're just smoldering embers. They're nothing. Yeah. Like, they're, 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 their flame has already been snuffed out. Yep. Like, to you, it might seem like a raging fire, but yep. to me, it's nothing. And what Ahaz does is something that, you know, we, um, we tend to do. Yep. Which is, okay, I heard you, I'm listening, but, <laughs> but, and... You don't know everything I know, God. <clears throat> right, you know, like from, I know more from where you I'm sitting, you know, it looks like this, cra you know, whatever, the, these <clears throat> crazy things are happening, and I have to, you know, you, you hear, you hear there's another, here's another, you know, cliched saying, don't, don't just stand there, do something. Yep, yep. You know, yep. Um, and... We always feel like we, and that's where the faith, that's where if you don't believe, you know, you, you won't be established, is at the end of the day, you have to come to grips with, you can't always be in control. Right. You know, that's what we have to come to grips with. And, but then, you know, it, in the next section, when we get to 10, when we, you know, the, the, the interaction in uh, verses 10 through 16, you know, God does something that he doesn't do very often mm -hmm. in my recollection in, in the biblical record, which is say, whatever you want is a sign. You just, yeah. you tell me, whatever you want. What do you want, what do you want me to do to prove to you that I'm telling you the truth? Why do you think he does that? That's an interesting, is he, is he, I'm thinking he's sort of, all right, part of it is like, you think you're so smart, you know, you, you go along and you'll interpret life as you, choose to interpret it. And uh, so often that's what we, we, we find ourselves having to do with life, with people. Um, 
You know, there's, there's an old joke about a pastor who left being a pastor and he became an undertaker and uh, became an undertaker. And he says, why did you become an undertaker? He said, well, I spent, I can't remember, let's say 30 years trying to straighten people out, but they never stayed straight. Now when I straighten them out, they stay straight. <laughs> but it's, it's, there's a lot of truth to that in the sense that we just, where we get yourself straight and then you say, I thought we decided you were going to do, you just said you are going to do this. Instead you did that. And somehow often other, often things in the long run work out. Still nonetheless, they work out. And a lot of times people, as I see it, in the long run land on their feet. A lot of times they'll land on their feet after they go the wrong way. Eventually, a lot of times they'll come back. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. Um, but this is all leading up to an amazing Bible verse that I find amazing. That that in this in in Isaiah chapter seven is one of the most key messianic prophecies mm -hmm. there is in the Old Testament. And and I think that's significant. That in the this dark moment when it looks so bleak. God gives this glimmer of light. A ray of light is coming in to say, okay, listen, there's something else going on here that you don't really understand, Ahaz. You don't get this, but there's something far bigger that I've got planned. Uh, and and that's, that's something that's hard for us to understand. But when we look at our own lives, we see our little cosmo, cosmos, but we're, we're one chess. We're one piece, one player on the chessboard mm -hmm. that God has a grander plan for. And he's working that all out. He's working that all out. So, um, you know, one thing we didn't touch on, in, in, on from Monday's lesson was, why do you think Isaiah told him to bring his son as he confronts Ahaz? Any thoughts about that? Anybody from here today? I... Well, the, the lesson talks about the possible dual meaning of, of Isaiah's son's name. Yes. You know, a remnant shall return. A, a remnant, remnant shall return. Whom <coughs> shall return from what? Um, so he talks about, you know, there's, there's a little bit of double entendre sort of going on there. Yep. And I think it ties in very closely to the verse, the prophecy, you know, a virgin shall conceive um, that you're talking about. And... I touched on this a little bit last week, so I won't digress into like digress into all of it again. But if you look at the grand narrative of Scripture, it's all about God's presence. God wants to be present with His creation, and so yep. Eden functioned as a temple. Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden because they can't be; they can no longer be in God's presence. Right. And so, from that moment until Revelation, is God trying to, well, not trying, because whatever God wants to do, he does, but, but God sort of dealing with human frailty to bring about this grand plan so that he can be present with his creation again. And part of this interaction between Isaiah and Ahaz makes me think about, you know, you, you, you read some of the things that Ellen White wrote about um, the, the Advent movement <laughs> and the Second Great Awakening and things in the 19th century about how if we would have done things maybe a little bit differently, the conditions could have been present for the Second Coming. Yep. And yep. so, again, God allows free will. You know, it made me just, it, this is all speculative, but maybe if Ahaz had been faithful, Christ would have come <laughs> earlier. Yep. Because he says, tell me, what, tell me whatever sign you want to see to prove to you that I'm not lying to you. Yep. And Ahaz kind of blows him off. So what God does is he says, and here's his son, you know, he has this message coming through his son. You can either repent now or a remnant will return. That's yep. really, these are your two options. You can, you can take me at my word now or there will be a remnant who has to return to the land in the future. And so with this offering of, you know, any kind of sign you want, Ahaz blows him off. God basically says, right, I'm going to give you my own sign. A virgin yep. will conceive 
and you'll call his name Emmanuel, which is going to bring about my presence, God with us. But now, now it's a different timeline, okay. right? You, you, you could have gone to the left in the fork in the road, but you chose right. And I'm kind of giving you a foreshadow of, and now it's going to be centuries before I'm yeah. able to work that out because your decision today is ultimately going to lead to more political intrigue that eventually will it wind up in the Babylonian captivity. Yep. And that's going to bring about a completely different set of circumstances. Yep. And that's kind of how I thought about this interaction between Isaiah and Ahaz. I like the way you tied that in. <clears throat> and, and, <clears throat> and you sort of, I don't know how many studied the lesson, but you sort of got to the climatic ending. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Did I move too it was, fast? We were going to have a drum roll. And da-da, here's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9 or 14. So who saw that one coming? But that's part of the picture. We right. don't see what happens. Now, there's something intri intriguing that happens here where, where um, in verse 11, ask the Lord for a sign, whether it be the deepest depth or the highest heights. That's an interesting offer. If God said <clears throat> to me, to you, if you want a sign, I'll give it to you. You want me to make the moon turn green? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, turn, uh, you know what I'm saying, anything. Yeah. He would have done it. And, and instead, it says here in verse 12, but Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. <clears throat> That's filled, that's filled with irony because he's already testing God. <laughs> by not believing, not, yeah. by not taking his word. Yeah. He's already frustrating God. It would have been easier for God to say, listen, I will turn the moon green if you want. Mm -hmm. That would have been easier for him than deal with this. And just to say, okay, be careful, stay calm. God's will is going to be done. God's will will be done. So, And you can make a lot of connections hermeneutically or you know if you were writing a sermon or something with that because obviously there's a, it's a there's a commandment in deuteronomy thou shalt not put the lord your god to the test mm -hmm. right? it's quoted by jesus right right in the wilderness when he's tempted by satan who's claiming to have dominion over the kingdoms of the earth now here you have the king of the universe the creator god offering right saying Test me. I'm, I, you tell me whatever you want. You know, ask me to do anything. I'll do whatever you ask. Yep. I mean, that's an amazing thing for, for God to say. Yep. You know, and then it, it also brings back recollections of you know, Abraham standing and looking out towards Sodom and Gomorrah and bargaining yeah. with God and saying, you know, surely if there's 50 people in the city, you won't destroy it. That's, 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 that's not your character. You know? mm -hmm. And God allowing, accommodating, con I've used this word before, condescending himself to, to, the, to a level that human beings can understand. And that's what he's doing here with Ahaz. And Ahaz twists God's own words, just like the devil did in the wilderness with Jesus, twists God's own words in order to sort of resist God's offer, yep. to disobey God. So yep. he's, he's, he's relying on this misinterpretation, misapplication of, of Scripture, Deuteronomy, in order to um, disobey God. And like you said, and, he's, he, and his, his, his claim of not wanting to test God is actually a test of God. Yeah, it is. You know. And, and um, we had a question come in. Do we have any idea how far into the reign of Ahaz this happened? Had he already sacrificed his son? How much wickedness had he done? Uh, yet, ooh. Hold on. Now my... Boy, oh boy, I tell you. Uh, uh, how much, uh, had he already sacrificed his son? How much wickedness had he done? Yet God was giving him this chance. Now, yes, we know that, that Ahaz does that. He, was, he, was a, he sacrifices his uh, son to the, burning him. It was, I, I don't remember all the details, but um, that's a good question. I, I'm going to uh, 2 Kings chapter 16, um, it's, in this, uh, he was 20 years old when he became king, and he right. reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Right. Uh, 
During his entire reign, he refused to return the sins of idolatry. I'm going to say he did do it. He sacrificed his son before this happened. But maybe that's just a, that's an educated, what they call educated guess. Huh. Maybe that would have been part of the message. No? I don't know. Well, if that's the case, I mean, if that's the case, we don't have to do all the research, but I mean, if that's the case, you know, that, that's, there's a lot of scenarios that, possible scenarios that could have played out that way. Yeah. You know? And maybe that has something to do with why <clears throat> God told <clears throat> Isaiah to bring his son. Hmm. As if to, and I don't know, this is, then that would come up to the character of God. Would God want to rub it in to Ahab? Say, well, Ahaz, you know, you could have had your son, but here's Isaiah. He's got his son with him, and, and uh, God's honoring, he's being with Isaiah. We, God would have been with you, King Ahaz, oh, had yeah. you been it was faithful. after. I mean, if you go by the chronology, the way that the narrative of Second Kings 16, it, it, before it talks about this event, that uh, Isaiah is dealing with. It says, you know, he, he sacrificed his own son. He burnt incense in the pagan shrines. So that was after this, what we're reading? This is before. Oh, that's before. Before Isaiah's interaction with him. Okay. So, so he has his sort of, you know, he's sort of given, he's already given himself over to yep. this pagan idolatry. He's behaving like the king of Israel yep. in more ways than one. Yeah. And that's pretty, so this is the mercy of God on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is serious mercy here. I mean, he's like holding his nose and closing his eyes, saying, I'm really being merciful to you, Ahaz, because... And that's an interesting point, too. And I, I don't mean to digress too much, but you just kind of make me think, and tying it into last week's lesson and all the things that we talked about, and you know, some of the things you know, we talked about what happened here in, in the capital of the United States. And last week I mentioned, you know, what really sort of saddened me, maybe angry after, but I was sad at first, was all the people with the Christian symbols yeah. and the flags. And, um, there's, there's lessons there. There's lessons here for what, the way we think about these types of events today, I think. You know, we, yeah. we, we are tempted on so many levels. Yeah. And it's not just whatever party you belong to or anything yeah. like that. We're tempted on so many levels to adopt the world's methods yeah. and adopt the world's way of looking at problems. Yeah. And we have this repository of wisdom yeah. that when we, when we go that direction, when we start to adopt the world's methods, and we think that you know, the success of one worldly group over another has yeah. some sort of implications for the church and the gospel, yep. then we're running into the same problem. We're going down the same path that Ahaz yep. was taking in, in this week's mm -hmm. lesson. You know, we're not relying on God's providence. Right. And you know, it's interesting because <clears throat> some of us are familiar with Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. <clears throat> Boy, there's a frog in there. They didn't mean very nice. <laughs> um, and one of the habits is to think win-win. You know, we can set up a scenario where we both are winning, but most people think win-lose. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the way they approach the problem, and that's how things have become. It's a win-lose scenario. And, and we need to come back to that simple win-win. And, and uh, as far as, as we go, as far as uh, the world goes, Everything, yeah, it's not everything is a zero sum. Right, game. it isn't. It isn't. So, so, so. Listen, um, Kari, thank you for asking those questions. It was good. Very good point. And uh, <clears throat> um, so he doesn't. <clears throat> he doesn't put God to the test. Why? This sounds kind of sanctimonious. False piety. False piety. Yeah. I mean, of all the times you're going to claim, take the religious high road, quote unquote, you're going to do it now, Ahaz? And, right. <clears throat> and the lesson makes a point too, you know, what does that say about God's forbearance when it comes to <clears throat> attempting to call us to repentance? 
right. or, you know, attempting, you know, his, his forbearance in terms of allowing us, you know, he, want, he you know, if, 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 if it were possible, it is possible theoretically, but, you know, he, he, that everyone would come to repentance, that everyone would throw yeah. themselves at the foot of the cross. That's ultimately God's desire. And obviously not everyone's going to make that decision, but, you know, this is a great illustration of that in the sense that, you know, the, the, he sacrificed his, his son to pagan gods. He's, he's actively engaged in pagan worship. And then, you know, you think of the term repentance. You know, he has his, uh, Isaiah has his son, which could mean mm -hmm. repent. Yep, yep. You know, and repentance, the, you know, like a, a, literal, a literal view of repentance is a 180 degree turn. Yep. You know, That's and he's right. saying, like, you are walking down the same path that, you know, you can make all kinds of connections. Sorry, my mind's just kind of like wandering here, but, you know, Israel has done this already. The northern kingdom has done this. The northern kingdom has completely abandoned itself to pagan worship. It's completely given up on the knowledge of God that it has. And they've allied themselves with this, this foreign nation, and now they're running around, you know, doing all these terrible things. Yeah. And, you know, he's saying, you're, you're on the cusp of doing the same thing. Yeah. It's not working out well for them. Yeah. You know, and of course, in a short period of time from this point, you know, the Assyrian Empire will come and wipe Israel off the map. Yeah. So, there's a, there's a lot of connections that can be made here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to No, no, this is digress. really cool. Very time, no, it's all, it, all, it all applies. And, and of course, so he, he has re responds in verse 13. <clears throat> can you read 13 through 14, Roger? 13 through 14. While I take a drink of water here. Sure. <clears throat> Feed the frog. Yeah. <laughs> Unclean frog. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll actually start at 10 just to give the whole context. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. Then the Lord said to Ahaz, saying, Oh, spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? that you will try the patience of my God as well. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Mm. Wow. I'm glad you read the context. Gives a lot more richer meaning to it. And of course, it's interesting. He, there's so much here. Here is one of our key messianic prophecies, Isaiah 7, 14. And as I say, is we as Christians, we do need to, we owe it to ourselves to, to have a few classic uh, messianic prophecy, prophetic Bible verses in our minds. Um, because there may be a time when somebody comes up to you and say, why is Jesus the Messiah? Why is he the one? Obviously there were hundreds of births that time. Why him? And so it's good to have a few of these, like Isaiah 14. Well, here's one of the, 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 the prophecies to tell us how God would become with us. Now, it's interesting because Ahaz he's, what would you say, how would you describe Ahaz? Um, I'm not going to call him clueless. He's confused, maybe bewildered. He's given up his son. We figured this out. And here's Isaiah with his son. And he says, guess what? Uh, the, the word virgin can also be translated, a young lady will conceive and give birth to a son. And guess what? Emmanuel, which is, of course, who? God with us. Mm-hmm. God will be with you. And, and that's... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That, that, I think that's important, right? Because so one of the things, even, the, even, the, even the, the kings of Judah who turned away from actual worship and sort of gave themselves over to um, pagan worship and abandoned their knowledge of God. You know, you, you, later on in some of the minor prophets, you 
I forget, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank with the actual citation, but you have, you know, God saying, going to them when they're disobedient, he's saying, like, you're, you're, you're putting all your faith in this temple. Mm-hmm. What are your sacrifices to me? Yeah. What's the blood of bulls? <clears throat> and you, you, you say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You know, God's kind of given the same message. I think it might be Micah, but I'm not it sure. It might be Micah. Yeah. I'm not 100% certain, yeah. but I'll take your word for it. So, well, don't do you that. Know, That's you would a know mistake better than number me. one. <laughs> um, but, you know, God's kind of saying the same thing here. He's like, my purposes aren't going to be thwarted. Right. Whatever your decision today, my purposes will not be thwarted. Yep. I can work through whatever you throw at me. Yeah. Kind of, there's, there's a message there. You know, what sign do you want? I can do anything. Yeah, and I, Ahaz is so wrapped up in these political events around him that he can't see the bigger picture. Yeah, right. And he, you know, he might be relying on the fact that well, we have the temple of the Lord here. That's yeah. what Solomon did. Yep. You know, and it's interesting that say he, you know, Isaiah refers it to House of David. You know, he's 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 giving Ahaz all of these prompts. Yeah. That that will cl- make his mind click and go. You know what? hey, you know, he's really trying to tell me something here. House of David, David's son, you know, the temple, all these things. And ultimately, the temple is meaningless. You see the temple is, you, you're here to, you know, protect this temple, which is my presence on earth. My yep. presence on earth is going to be established regardless come, come what may, of any it's of happening. This, right? And these two right. kingdoms that you're worried about, when my Messiah, when I actually, when I firmly establish my presence on earth and in human history by becoming a human being, these kingdoms that you're worried about aren't going to exist anymore. Right. You know, big picture thinking. And so I think, in a, again, a, a, a contemporary application, you know, when you're sitting in, in last week and you're watching these yahoos, you know, do what they did yeah. in Washington, D.C., or you see people almost literally losing their minds over yeah. all the things that are going because one side or the other you know, you have to keep it in perspective and say, God's purposes are not going to be thwarted. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the Oval Office. Right, right. It, if it didn't matter who was sitting on David's throne in Jerusalem, right. it certainly does not matter <laughs> who's sitting in the Oval Office. That's right. And that's really, I think, for a modern context, um, I know we're running out of time. What, we have five minutes left? Is it 11 got seven five? minutes, I think. Seven okay. minutes, yep. But I think that's really one of the things that we need to, to draw from this too is, you know, God's giving this messianic prophecy and it has that meaning for us and we say it at Christmas time and, and things like that, but it's really in the story as we're reading it today, it's God saying, like, my, my purposes are not, right. stop worrying so much. Amen. Amen. You know? Let's get a show of hands. How many are going to worry less this week? All right, we're going to at least try. Give yes. it a valiant effort, all right? <laughs> valiant effort. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned that quote that I've heard before that had, the Lord could have come, I don't know if it was 1888, 1844. Yeah, I think it was in the 1888 context, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting. when that, well, I've, I've read that quote, and it's like, Okay, is that a good thing to know or not a good thing to know? And I'm saying this because does it kind of set us up for a false sense of, not security, but of power that, well, if we could just do this, Jesus would come next year or this year. And, and I think the only, and I'm saying that with a caveat, the only criteria for for Jesus to come. And we often look at, you know, our understanding of Daniel Revelation, but we always forget criteria number one, the gospel must go to the entire world. Mm -hmm. The good news has got to get to the whole world. And no matter what happens in, in, in the geopolitical situation, the Lord said it's gonna go. And that's, remember we used to talk about the 1040 window. Mm-hmm. that part of the Middle East where it's virtually, from our perspective, virtually impossible to bring the gospel because of, of, the, of the, the laws that are there. You can't proselytize, et cetera, et cetera. How are we going to get in there? Oh, well, we've got radio. We can do this and that and internet. And maybe, but, but that's not really, what does it mean to bring the gospel in? What does it mean? And that's a whole other discussion 
But it's interesting is, is uh, you know, the Lord, before he left, my job, our job, is to make disciples. That's what we're supposed to do, make disciples, right? That's what we're, we're call, called to do. And some of we have to say, okay, when, and, and even Jesus said, I don't know when I'm coming back. Right. Only God the Father knows this. And sometimes we just need to say, okay, he is coming back. He is coming back. And, and my timeline and, this t and his timeline, we need to get him synchronized. Synchronized. You know, and that's a process. You know, Ahaz, he saw his world coming to an end here. And then God said, hey, look, chill out. <laughs> right. Chill out. And then he tops it off by saying, guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your mind away because guess what? I'm going to be with you one day. Emmanuel, I'm going to be there. And, and all of your angst and worry is, means nothing because, like you said, I've got my plan. It's going to happen. And to top it off, God's going to be with you. God's going to be with you. And, and uh, that's something just reassuring to know that, you know, we, we, it's simplistic. We said the Bible can be summarized in two words, God wins. Right. And, and it's simplistic, but it's, it's true. God does win. And us as, as people like Isaiah, it behooves us to say, okay, I'm going to be on that team, <laughs> on God's team, because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how it's all going to wrap up. Well, I mean, you just said it, you know, what's the, what's the one criteria that we're given before the second coming has to, you know, before all the, the end time events can happen? It's the gospel has to go everywhere in the world. Well, what was Isaiah doing to Ahaz that day? He was preaching the gospel. He was, that's right. And, you know, <coughs> the thing about the 88, uh, 1888 quotation that we talked, and you mentioned, you know, is, is, it, is it maybe a little bit misleading? I look at it in the context of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and you have all these people proclaiming him to be the son of David, essentially identifying him as the Messiah. And, of course, identifying someone as a Messiah in that period of time was very dangerous because... Of course, the priests and everybody get worried that, you know, it's going to be Passover and the Romans are going to see this yeah. and they're going to shut down the temple and we won't be able to offer the sacrifice and then what's going to become of us? Mm -hmm. And so they, they go to Jesus' disciples and go to Jesus and they say, you know, maybe we, Jesus' own disciples, you know, hey, maybe we should tell them to like knock off the Messiah stuff, you know, stop yeah. talking about this son of David thing. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if they don't say it, the stones, the will, stones cry will cry out. out. And yep. I think that the 1888 message there, not the 1888 message, but, you know, the thing about um, could Jesus have come, and, and along with what, what Isaiah told Ahaz, is it's a warning, mm -hmm. right? Because are we doing everything we can to spread the gospel? Yeah. You know, have we, are we exhausting all of our opportunities to reach out and do the things that Jesus did while he was, because all I mean, Jesus is our example. We should be doing everything that Jesus yeah. did. How many yeah. people have we fed, that, not you personally, but how many people have we fed this week? Yeah. How many people who are hurting have we gone and just been with them, yep. you know, held their hand, let them cry on our shoulder? How many people, I mean, I don't know, are we really out there doing these yeah. things? And this is, I, I direct this criticism at myself. It's not, it's as an institution. Yep. Are we actually doing, doing the work that. of the gospel? Yep. That's the warning. Because if we don't, I, I've said this before from the pulpit, if we don't do it, God will certainly find someone else to do it. Mm -hmm. Period. That's just the way yep. God works. And that's the way he's working with Ahaz here. And I just, I know we have to go, but I just wanted to point out one thing. And I was, I was going to drag us down memory lane. But, uh, and yeah, tie us... And tie this, I, I just want to tie this into another um, current application. On, on Friday's lesson, the discussion questions, question number three, and I just, I spent so much time oh, reading my, about this. Oh, yes. We didn't get to, to those. I have to spend like an hour and a half at like five in the morning. With the, uh, discussion question three, Russian author Leo Tolstoy um, wrote to a friend that once a man has realized that death is the end of everything, then there is nothing worse than life either. How does our knowledge that God is with us answer such a statement? And I don't know if you guys know anything about Leo Tolstoy, if there's any Tolstoy-like scholars in here. Cameron's not with us. I know he's a big fan. 
But Leo Tolstoy converted to Christianity. It wasn't exactly Orthodox Christianity. I don't have to go into that, but at the age of 50, mm. he had this like deep spiritual crisis. He had been a religious seeker his whole life, and at the age of 50, um, he converted to Christianity. And it was this overwhelming sense that he just wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And he finally kind of, it, it was the Sermon on the Mount that mm. became his sort of like focus. And Leo Tolstoy was a, a, a count. He was a, no, he was a nobleman in the Russian uh, aristocracy. He was very wealthy. He inherited yep, giant right. farms and hundreds of serfs and all this kind of thing. He signed over every piece of property that he owned to his family after this conversion experience. And he gave up on the government or society doing yeah. the good things that Christians are commanded to do in the Sermon on the Mount. And he dedicated the rest of his life to advocating for, you know, he, he was organizing schools for poor children, he was feeding yeah. people, he was doing all these things that he saw in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think that when he, you know, we're, when once a man has realized that death is the end of everything, then there is nothing worse than life either. Think about Ahaz, yeah. right? For Ahaz, this was it. If he didn't, if he couldn't find a way to get through this military, political threat that Israel was facing, in his mind, it's over. Yeah, yeah. And that's what Leo Tolstoy was kind of saying about human beings generally. When you think that whatever immediate crisis you see in front of you is it, like your life is over at that point. Yeah. There's a much bigger picture. Again, God's telling Ahaz, you know, look at look at it from my perspective, and Ahaz just. Refused to do it. Ultimately, it was his choice. He refused to do it. And so I think one of the questions, mm -hmm. one of the pastoral sermonic questions, I think, that we have to ask ourselves from this lesson is, are we willing to step out of our comfort zone and look at things from God's perspective and then follow through on what that perspective reveals and actually act in mm -hmm. accordance with and consistently with what that information brings to our knowledge, you know, what, what that view brings to our knowledge. And our, and our hearts, yeah. Hopefully it changes our hearts. Yeah, I think that's where Leo Tolstoy, <coughs> Cameron, we were talking about Tolstoy. Um, but uh, I think that's what the, the Tolstoy snippet there, sort of yeah. one, of the, one of the directions we can go with, with his experience. Yeah. So that's a good note to wrap, wrap up on. So why don't we bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for Isaiah chapter 7. And, and the fact that it reminds us of the fact that you, you, you have a plan that is more grandiose and more amazing than what we can even imagine. And so, Lord, we pray, particularly this week, that you, you'll help us to always remember that, to remember that. And, and be with us as we remember this verse through this whole entire year that you are with us, you are here. And Lord, we want to thank you for this uh, lesson and thank you for the fact that it's just so, so timely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.